We have been studying, Lord, Make Me a Servant, and tonight's the last night of that series because next week we'll have prayer and song of Thanksgiving as we get ready for the holiday. I have really enjoyed putting the series together. I had some, some very good material to do it from, and I think it's been a really good series. And I hope everyone understands that as I put together a class or a sermon or whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm first teaching to me <laughs> because I need it worse than, than uh, pretty much anybody else. And then secondly, teaching to the class. So hopefully I've, I've done an adequate job of putting together something that was meaningful to everyone. It's, um, it's not sometimes, a, well, I have a problem with James chapter 3, verse 1, so I have to make sure I'm, I'm talking to myself. Uh, that's kind of my mechanism for, for uh, putting that class together. So uh, I've enjoyed doing it, and I think it's been a good study. I enjoy topical, I enjoy textual, enjoy them both, and, and there's a right time and right place for both, and I think it's, I've enjoyed studying it. Um, let's turn to the Old Testament and turn to Judges first, Judges chapter 14. True or false statement? <clears throat> well, wait a minute. I've got to back up. What's the mantra been of the class about Lord make me a servant? Serving is about God, and serving is not about me. And we'll have a couple of examples of that tonight that I think are pretty good examples. If I ask you, true or false statement, a servant of God is filled with the Spirit of the Lord. True or false? True? Absolutely. A good servant of God, a servant of the Lord, is filled with His Spirit. It's what makes us do those things that we do that are serving. And if I ask you to give me some examples of servants of God who were filled with the Spirit, what would you come up with? Pardon? Dorcas. Dorcas. How so? Well, she, she, where she was at, where the Lord had her, she helped the people that were right there around her. I mean, she may have been gone on missionary journey or something, but she was doing for the Lord what she could where she was at. Okay, good example. Who else? Is that the only one? Or is Pat the only one that's willing to go out on a limb and say something? I heard Lydia. How so? Um, Dirk was talking about Lydia. What was Lydia's function? What did she do for a living? She had a job but yet she found a way to also be of service to God. Sometimes we also think of something a little more um, showy, I guess. Do we not as well? When we think of being filled with the Spirit of the Lord. There's a story about Samson in Judges chapter 14. And the phrase is used that Samson was filled with the Spirit of the Lord. You know what he did? You remember what he did there in chapter 14? Verse 5. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came towards him roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the line in pieces as one tears a young goat. Samson did some other things, too, that were rather um, on the grand scale. 
when it came to serving God, did he not? What about um, the apostles on the day of Pentecost? The Spirit of the Lord fell upon them, and what did they do? Spoke in tongues, and, and the message was received by people of different nationalities and different places, and the, and the word spread on that particular day. All of these things have to do with being a servant, but they may or may not necessarily be things that we think about applications to us. Are we going to be tearing any lines apart anytime soon? What about the story about um, Zechariah in 2 Chronicles chapter 24? Do you, do you remember what that's about? Do you remember the, the king Joash? What was significant about Joash? Pardon, Chuck? His age. How old was he when he became king? Seven. Well, I think it was seven. You said eight. Hang on a second. No, it's seven. All right. I had to stop and make me think for just a minute. Joash became king when he was age seven. Did he have a good reputation or a bad reputation? And that's kind of a trick question. It's a little bit of both, wasn't it? He had some good years and then he had some bad years. There was a priest named Jehoiada, and the scripture says that as long as Jehoiada lived, Joash did right in the sight of God. And he restored the temple. And he went back and he says, you know, there were a lot of things done previously that we've let go. And we're going to get back to those things. Moses collected a tax and that tax was used for the tabernacle. And and we're going to do that and we're going to build back God's temple. We're going to look at these things. We're going to make God a place. And he had a right and good motivation. And then what happened to Jehoiada? At the end of 130 years, he died. Then what happened to Joash? Which way did he go? (laughs) He went downhill. Why? Because his mentor wasn't there anymore? Because whatever? Because other people came in and got Joash's attention? and convinced him that it was better to go the way that the world was going rather than the way that God was going. Jehoiada had a son. His name was Zechariah. What did Zechariah do? Scripture says he was filled with the Spirit of God. Have I given you the chapter? 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 20. Then the Spirit of God clothed Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, and he stood above the people and he said to them, Thus says God, Why do you break the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. How much nerve do you think it takes to tell off the king? What was normal procedure for being able to go talk to the king? Think about Esther. He was summoned. He didn't didn't show up there. He had to be summoned. What, What chance did Esther take when she walked in to see the king? And she was the queen, but yet he could have had her killed when she went in unannounced. Zechariah stood up the spirit of, the God clo- the spirit of God clothed him and he stood in front of the king and he basically told the king, you've forgotten everything you once knew. And then what did they do to Zechariah? Stoned him, killed him. End of that story. So when the spirit of the Lord fills us in, 
our time today, are we likely to have some of these situations where we'll be standing in front of the President of the United States or standing in, in front of the King telling the King off? No. Are we likely to be facing a lion and, and need to tear him limb to limb or push out the columns of the temple and kill all the Philistines? No. But are we likely to be like Lydia, which was brought up earlier? Then absolutely. There is a story about a person named Bazael. Do you know who Bazael is? Yes, no, maybe. You heard of him? Do you know who her was? Her? Not Ben Her. <laughs> you remember who her, who her? How about her and Aaron? Remember a story about her and Aaron? Turn to chapter 17 of Exodus. Israelites were in a battle against the Amalekites. As long as Moses held his hands up, what happened? They prevailed in battle. What happened when his hands started to drop? Started losing in battle. What did Aaron and Hur do? Took Moses, set him on a rock, got situated on either side of him, and held up his arms. Now, what does that have to do with Bazael? Well, her was Bazael's grandfather. Now, we're still in the book of Exodus. We're going to go forward to chapter 31. And look there real quick and tell me what God is giving the Israelites instructions to do at that particular point. What are they about to do? Hmm? I know you're thinking it. You're just not saying it out loud. I require an answer before I can move forward. <laughs> Judy's got her hand up, and she's going to tell me that they were getting ready to do what? Build the tabernacle. Isn't that what you said, Judy? I thought it was. Okay, they're getting instructions for all kinds of things there, are they not? Got, they've got a tabernacle. They've got a place for God in the wilderness. How many instructions do you think they had concerning that tabernacle? And I don't I mean, like, did they have 72 different instructions? They had a bunch, did they not? It was very ornate, was it not? It was very detailed, was it not? They got all of that stuff put together. Look in chapter 31 of Exodus. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by the name Bazael, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut stones for setting, to carve wood, to work in every craft, and behold, I have, have appointed with him Oholiab. I stumble with these names and I've read them all my life. The son of somebody of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils, the pure lampstand with its utensils, the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand, and the finely worked garments, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priest, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded, they shall do. Is that a pretty big job order? How would you like to be the guy in charge of putting all that together? Would you, have a, would you feel that you had an important job? How do we treat uh, famous, I'm sorry, Dirk, what? 
Well, the Lord did give him all the ability. The Lord has given us a lot of ability as well. In this particular case, the Lord gave him this spe specific ability to be able to do these specific things. But as you're walking around the camp, and there's a certain pecking order that goes with whomever you might be, would you be puffing your chest out perhaps a little bit more when you had this particular job? Who was going to be responsible for putting that tabernacle together? And all the stuff that Aaron wore, pretty big job. Would you consider him to be a servant of God? Certainly. He was doing God's will, was he not? How much else do we know about Bazael? How much did you know about him before tonight? How much else are we told about him after we get through right here? Nothing. This is it. He's the grandson of her. How do we hold up great architects in history? People who have built great cathedrals and great buildings that have stood the test of time. Frank Lloyd writes, if we, if we get a little closer to our time in the United States, buildings that he built. How is that architect revered or that builder revered? What about Bazael? He stepped back and he looked at that tabernacle, that tent, and he said, my handiwork. Are we told any of that in here? Whose tabernacle was it? Was it Bazael's? It was God's. Who got the glory? God got the glory. Who built it in God's, at God's instruction? Bazael. He did a servant's job. Do you know what the name Bazael means? In the shadow of God. And that's what a servant truly is. Bazael worked in the shadow of God to make what was arguably the most important building of its time to us as Christians, to them as Israelites, right? What happened in the tabernacle? What took place there? Pardon? Tommy talks about the offerings and the sacrifices that took place there. The worship of God that took place there. Pardon? The presence of the Lord. Who came to the tabernacle? God did. Where did He go? Who went in with Him? Where was the, the most holy place? In the middle of that was where God came and communed with the Israelites. Pretty important facility, even though it was a temporary facility because it traveled with them from place to place. Who got the glory? God got the glory. Who built it? Bazael did. He did his job. He was God's servant, and he served in the shadow of God. Why is it so hard for us, for me, to take a second fiddle, to take second chair, to work in the shadow of God as a servant. I built this skyscraper, this monument. It's a legacy to my children. I want my name put on the bottom. Was Bazael's name anywhere on the tabernacle? Ruth? No, you certainly don't. And, I'm, and that's part of the point here as well. Yes, absolutely. We're using Bazael in this particular example as he built that tabernacle. In history, he doesn't get the credit for it other than here in chapter 31. 
But we all should be working in the shadow of God, should we not? And we are. And Lydia was, as Pat brought up earlier. So absolutely, no, no argument there. Not meaning to imply that the only way you can be a servant is work on something. But in this particular case, I guess the distinction I was trying to draw was in order, in, a, in importance to them, how important was that tabernacle? And Bazael's job was one that was, even though he built it, in the background. Turn to Mark chapter 9. Look at verse 33. <clears throat> Why is it difficult for us to work in the shadow of God and give God the glory rather than us? We've said it this whole class series. Serving is about God. Serving is not about me. But why is it hard for us to do that? Human nature. We strive for the attention. We want the name, the glory. I want to see my name on the cornerstone of that building. I want to point out to my grandchildren, I built that building. Mark chapter 9, verse 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Who is they? And he sat down and he called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last and servant of all. And he took a child and he put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me but him who sent me. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. It's hard, isn't it, to put others in front of us? And we're kind of wired that way a little bit, aren't we? Do you want to be in the front of the line or the back of the line? No matter what the line is. Do you rush to get up towards the front so you can do whatever? Because isn't what I have to do more important than what the other guy has to do? Aren't I in a bigger hurry than whomever because my time is more important? Let each of you look not only to his own interests but also to the interests of others. Have this mind amongst yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. If we're going to be a servant, we're going to have to exercise humility. There's no two ways about it. I remember a few years ago, I was in BJ's, and uh, if y'all know Inel's, my mother-in-law's sister, Shirley, at the time her husband was alive, Calvin. And I had gone to BJ's to get some things for the office, and Calvin was with me. And I had a cart, one of those flatbed carts, that was just piled up with everything under the sun. I think we had a Christmas tree on it. We had supplies for some of our clients. We had stuff for the office. And this woman came up and, and she said, um, would you mind if I went in front of you? I'm in a really big hurry. And Calvin looked at her and says, well, I don't care how big a hurry you're in. I don't think you're in a, any bigger hurry than what he is. And she proceeded to tell us why her time was more important than mine was. And Calvin wasn't buying any of it. And I just kind of sat back and enjoyed it and listened to it. And after he got through, I decided I, I, my time was a lot more important than hers. 
And I should have been in the front of the line and know she was not about to step in front of me because after all, I was much more important than what she was. But such is not the case really, is it? I mean, did Jesus ever put himself first? Who was first? God was first. And then everything else fell in place after that. All right, what about Micah? Have you ever heard of Micah? And I'm not talking about Micah, M-I-C-A-H, the prophet that there's, there's a book for. I'm talking about the other Micah. That's M-I-C-A-I-A-H, or something that effect. You ever heard of that one, that Micah? Or maybe it's Micaiah. I don't know. Tommy's, you've heard it. Tell me the story. No. <laughs> Well, he was a prophet, and he would speak nothing except the word of God that that God put in his mouth. And he had dealings with a king that we all know the name of who was a very bad king. And if I said, name me a bad king, who would you name? Ahab. Absolutely. You know any kids named Ahab? Or girls named Jezebel? Oh, don't tell me, Steve, if you, if you do. I don't want to know him. Um, yeah, I shouldn't have asked that question with multiple teachers in the class because you probably, the name's out there somewhere, I guess. Um, Ahab wanted to go to war with Syria. And for whatever the reason, Ahab in the north and Jehoshaphat from the south were together, and they were talking with one another, and it's almost as if though Ahab really wanted to do this, but he needed a partner in crime. And he said, "Uh, Jehoshaphat, would you like to go to war with me? Let's take back uh, Ramoth of Gilead. We can get this thing done. We can go to battle. We can take it back. It's ours. And Jehoshaphat said, well, I've got horses. They're your horses. I've got men. They're your men. But first... Let's inquire of God. Now, both men should have been God's servants, should they not? They were both king king of the Hebrews, kings of the Israelites. How many good kings were in the north, by the way? Remember? Less than... Less than one. Do you remember how many were good kings from the south? I don't remember the number, but there were a few. Steve's holding up four. We'll go with that. We'll go with four. Fact is, there were some in the south and zero in the north. Ahab was one of those bad kings from the north. Jehoshaphat was one of those kings that that did good things from the south. Even though the people still worshipped in the high places during his reign, he, he followed God for the most part. And he sits down and he says, Ahab, we need to really discuss this. We need to hear what God says about this before we go half-cocked into battle. And Ahab says what? You're right. I've got some prophets. We'll call them. And how many people did he call? Give me a number. What, Chuck? Did you say something? Seven? Seven? More. Give me another number. Next number you're going to give me is ten, right? More. More. Next number, 70, more. (laughs) 400. He had 400 prophets. And he brought them in, and he says, Shall I go to battle against Syria? And what did they say? Absolutely, you betcha. You're the man. You got them. Go kick them. Take advantage of them. Whoop them. You're going to take them because you are the king. What did Jehoshaphat say? Well, this is all well and good, but could I get a 401st opinion? You know, we're not told exactly why they're together. We're not told a lot about the discussion because the point here is what did God really want to happen? But you kind of get the feeling that Jehoshaphat knew that the 400 were paying lip service to Ahab. And then what did Ahab say? Well, there is one other guy. His name is Micah. 
But you know what? He hates me. He can't stand me. He's a jerk. And every time he comes and talks, he says something bad about me. So I really don't want to listen to him. But Jehoshaphat said, I think we should one more time. And so they call for Micah or Micaiah, depending on how you want to look at it. Look in verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 7. I'm going to read 7 through 9. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micah the son of Imla, but I hate him. For he never prophesies good concerning me, but rather evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micah, the son of Imla. Now there's a, there is a side lesson here, and that is certainly that Ahab's attitude was, do not confuse me with the facts. I don't really want to know what the facts are. I just want you to agree with me. We know, I'm sure, have met over the years people who were yes people. And all they wanted was somebody to agree with them. Is that what a servant is going to do? Or is a servant going to do what's best for his master and give him honest input? In this particular case, what was the point of, that Ahab was trying to get at? He was wanting to know what God wanted done. And what did the 400 tell him? What they thought he wanted to hear. What's Micah about to tell him? Dirk? Well, yes, correct. Dirk mentions that Ahab was looking for the yes man. Jehoshaphat really wanted to know what God had to say. And that, that's the only conclusion we can draw from how the conversation went about the two of them. So Micah does come, and what's the first thing out of his mouth? Look in verse 13. And the messenger who went, to sum, to, who went to summon Micah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophet with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. Okay? Got the picture? Messenger goes to get him takes him to the side, whispers in his ear, Look, listen, 400 have already spoken to the positive on this deal. Do not go in there and be the one that is negative. King doesn't want to hear it. Let's just get through this initial meeting. Let's get on the battle. Let's get things done. What does Micah answer? As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that, will, that I will speak. Verse 15. And when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? And he answered him, Go up and triumph. The Lord will give it unto the hand of the king. He's got his fingers crossed behind his back the whole time he's saying it, or he's snickering when he says it, or he's laughing when he says it, because what does Ahab say immediately? Verse 16, how many times shall I make you swear to tell me the truth, Ahab? I mean, uh, Micah, words of Ahab. So Ahab knew immediately that Micah was pulling his string. And then what did Micah do? He told him the truth. He said, this is what God says, because I swore an oath to God that I would speak only His words. And what he said is, you're going to go up there and you're going to die. How did Ahab respond to that? Look down in verse uh, 25. Let's skip down to verse 25. All right, let's go to 26. 
And the king of Israel said, Seize Micah, take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this man in prison and feed him meager rations of bread and water until I come in peace. Once the battle's over with, I'll come back and deal with him. Until then, bread and water, put him in jail. How, how does Micah respond to that? And this is one of the great comeback lines of all time. You think it's only NBA players that talk smack to one another? Verse 28, and Micah says, If you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken to me. If you come back here, Ahab, the Lord has lied to me. That's what's happened. What did happen? Ahab goes out into battle, does he not? Changes clothes, clothes with Jehoshaphat because he's a coward and gets shot accidentally from an archer who just aimed his bow up in the air and let it fly. And it caught Ahab right between the crevice where the breastplate meets the, the shoulder part. And he died there in his chariot and the dogs licked up his blood. What's our job as a servant? To maintain the Word of God, period. End of story. Because whether you're a prophet of God or whether you're an architect making the tabernacle, who gets the glory? God does. And as Christians, we have a responsibility. As Christian servants, we have a responsibility to never detour, to never go away from God's Word, to be true to it always. Because it's not about us, it's about God. Comments or questions? I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Ahab and Micah, but the bell kind of got me so we shortcut it. Yes, no, nothing? Thank you very much for your attention tonight and for the whole quarter. I appreciate it.